We've got a lot to talk about in today's podcast. In addition to the usual discussion of Fed policy, interest rates, employment, the economy, we've got a lot of economic data that was released during the week. But we're going to talk specifically about what's going on in Europe. We've got that poll regarding Scottish independence, which they're going to be voting on next week. We've got negative interest rates in Japan and potentially in Switzerland as well. And that has also uh, taken a toll on those currencies in the foreign exchange markets. We're going to look at some comments from Paul Krugman and Henry Blodgett, really some asinine comments on inflation and on the Fed. And also, speaking about asinine, there's a column by David K. Johnson that is actually, he's making the case that corporations are actually getting rich by paying their taxes. Also, again, the NBA in the hot seat regarding some supposed racist comments that were made in an email. Bruce Levinson, an owner of a basketball team, Atlanta Hawks, sent an email and supposedly uh, this shows what a racist he is, what a bigot he is. But I actually read the email and there's nothing racist about it. The only racism is in the journalists who are reporting it as if there's actually something racist about it. In fact, I'm also going to talk in today's podcast about what I believe to be the overreaction to the Ray Rice situation. The former NFL player who was caught on videotape slapping or punching his then fiance. I'm going to talk more about the overreaction and the rush to judgment and how Ray Rice's wife and his daughter two women here who are actually going to end up suffering much more from the public's outrage than from the actual abuse. You make no friends in the pits and you take no prisoners. One minute you're up half a million in soybeans and the next boom, your kids don't go to college and they've repossessed your Bentley. Are you with me? The revolution starts now. Starts now. We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Turn those machines back on! You are about to enter the Peter Schiff Show. Show me the money! If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on Earth. The Peter Schiff Show is on. I don't know when they decided that they wanted to make a virtue out of selfishness. Your money, your stories, your freedom. The Peter Schiff Show. Not that much in the way of U.S. economic news on the week. It was a pretty quiet week, although next week I think we're going to get some news from the Federal Reserve, a new Fed meeting and a Fed statement people are talking about. But the news that did come out this week, some of the data points we got continue to be weak. And it's amazing how Wall Street just glosses over the weak economic data, specifically when it comes to the U.S. dollar and precious metals. We'll talk uh, more about the markets in the podcast and the dollar, again, strong on the week and gold very weak on the week. The markets ignoring the weak U.S. economic data, which should be undermining the the, the reason for buying the dollar, which is based on a strengthening U.S. economy, a U.S. economy where the Fed is going to be more aggressive, where the Fed is going to be tightening in contrast to Europe and Japan, which are going to be loosening. Yet we continue to gloss over the weaker economic data that would undermine the supposed basis by which the Fed would be tightening its monetary policy. Middle of the week on Wednesday, we got the purchase uh, applications for mortgages, mortgage purchase applications for the week, and the index declined by 7.2%, which is a big drop. It's the biggest decline in that weekly series in 14 years. Now, mortgage rates are moving up, and you know, Treasury yields are up on the week, But it's not a huge increase. It's just a very, very slight increase. And of course, rates will rise significantly further if the Fed actually does stop buying mortgages and raises interest rates. We'll have a much more profound impact. But we've barely moved rates higher and we have the biggest plunge in 14 years in purchase applications, mortgage applications to buy homes. 
Now, what about the jobless claims? Because jo- unemployment is a big factor in what is emboldening the Fed to even talk about a tighter monetary policy or a less loose monetary policy maybe is more appropriate, right? What is emboldening them is, well, that the unemployment rate supposedly is coming down, but the uh, claims jumped up last week to 315,000. They also revised the prior weeks up from 302 to 304. Not that big a revision, but still an upward revision. And now we're at 315,000. And if you look at the chart, to me, it looks like there's a trend change that we had been declining, declining. We got below 300,000. And now we're trending back up again. I think we're going to be north of 320, maybe moving back up to 340 to 360,000 in weekly unemployment claims. That is also going to cause some concern at the Fed that they are losing some of the progress they made in their supposed battle against unemployment. But of course, if the Fed actually continues to taper its quantitative easing and actually does raise interest rates, the number of people who are going to be thrown out of work is going to be far more substantial. In fact, I believe that many of the people who were not fired in the first half of the year, or maybe even some who were fired, uh, are going to end up getting laid off when the recovery that many businesses have been promised, when that recovery fails to materialize the same way that uh, recoveries have continuously eluded the Federal Reserve. Now, on Friday, we got a number, retail sales, and on the surface, that was supposed to be a good number, right? Retail sales for August were up six-tenths of a percent, and that was exactly what they were forecasting. So I guess the good news is that I guess it was up, right? It, it didn't exceed expectations, although they did revise upwards the prior month, which they originally reported as being zero or unchanged for retail sales. And they they boosted that to up 0.3%. But, you know, if you X out autos, it was the weakest number. It was just 0.3 if you don't count auto sales. That was the weakest retail sales number since January. And, of course, why are consumers buying a lot of automobiles? It's because of the increase in subprime financing for auto purchases. So a lot of people are being encouraged, uh, suckered into the new car market based on easy terms. And so a lot of this, again, is cannibalizing future sales, but goosing current sales, but probably more significantly, a lot of the people who are buying cars today Not only are they not going to buy cars tomorrow because they've already bought a new car, but many of these people are going to end up having a problem making their car payments. And so a lot of these loans might end up in default. In fact, um, for the week, there was a pickup in auto loan delinquency rates. They moved up uh, to 0.95%. That's a nine percent. That's the second quarter. We got that in news this week. That's a nine percent increase uh, from the 0.87 percent that we saw in the same quarter a year ago. So we already are starting to see a pickup in delinquencies, and we shouldn't even be seeing that, right? If the economy really were recovering, then the auto delinquency should be going down, not up. The fact that people are becoming increasingly delinquent in their car payments to me, is indicative of the fact that the economy is weakening, not strengthening. But getting back to these retail sales numbers, the most significant aspect of the retail sales numbers is that they are not adjusted for inflation. It's just how much did people spend? And there, you can spend more if prices go up. And of course, if your incomes don't go up, You'll have to make up the difference by either eating into your savings, which we know Americans are, or using your credit cards. And we know that credit card use is up. And I think one of the reasons that consumers have to rely more on their credit cards is because prices are higher and their incomes are not. And so they have to bridge the gap with a credit card. 
But the interesting thing about these numbers is that they actually, you know, are going to incorporate all the inflation, at least as it manifests itself in rising prices that the consumer is experiencing. Because in the CPI, they can pretend whatever they want, right? They can they, they can distort those numbers however they want to pretend that there's no inflation. And we're going to talk quite a bit on the podcast today about inflation because, you know, we got Henry Blodgett, we got Paul Krugman, the usual suspects out there talking about why there's no inflation and why guys like me have been completely wrong. And we know one of the reasons that it appears to guys like Krugman or guys like Blodgett that we're wrong is because they buy into the government numbers. But the one number that actually is going to have all the inflation in it is going to be retail sales because it measures the amount of money that people spend to buy stuff. And so whatever the price rises are, they're fully incorporated into retail sales. But when they report the retail sales, we don't know how much is consumers buying more or how much is consumers paying more. We just know that they've spent more money. And if you look at the numbers, they spent more money in a sporting goods stores or they spent more money at restaurants or they spent uh, more money at building supply uh, stores. But the question is, did they buy more sporting goods or did they just pay more money for the sporting goods they bought? Maybe they even bought fewer sporting goods. It's just that they paid more money for the fewer sporting goods that they bought. And so the net effect was they spent more. We don't know that. We just get the raw numbers in these numbers. So it's incorporating the amount of inflation. And so I think that is the only reason that consumer spending is going up. It's not because consumers are enjoying a higher standard of living and they're going out and buying more stuff. No, no, no. I think what they're doing is they're spending more money on the stuff that they need. And yes, they did buy some more cars because of the sweetheart deal that people were given. I mean, maybe these car dealerships are making people offers they can't refuse. And so people are taking advantage of the lack of lending standards and the cheap money and the government subsidies to get themselves a new car. But none of this is going to end well, just like the subprime mortgage uh, situation didn't end well. And in fact, speaking of subprime mortgages, I also read this year that there is a bill before Congress. I forget the, the number on the bill. It hasn't passed yet. But basically what this would do is it going to identify certain properties in, I guess, certain areas. And if they're under, I think, $300,000, I forget the exact uh, appraised value, but in certain uh, areas, and I think they have to do areas that are maybe heavily populated with minorities or low-income areas, whatever they're doing, but the government was going to exempt the requirement that the properties be independently appraised. So in other words, Fannie or Freddie would guarantee mortgages on properties without an independent appraisal if the properties were in a certain area where the government wanted to encourage lending. And of course, what they're ending, what they're, or home, home buying, but of course, what they're going to end up encouraging is fraud. Because what's going to happen is a lot of shacks are going to be over and play, over appraised. And so people are going to be able to borrow a lot of money on mortgages that are destined to end up in default with huge losses for the U.S. taxpayer, because if they're not getting independent appraisers and somebody, you know, overpays for a property and maybe they give somebody $200,000 because it appraises for $200,000, but it's really only worth $50,000 because the whole thing is phony. It's been trumped up because you've had no independent verification. So this is all that's happened. The government comes in. They're doing the same thing with auto sales. They're goosing the numbers. It makes it look like, you know, we have a more vibrant economy, but we're just lowering lending standards and we're allowing more people who can't afford something to buy it anyway and pushing the losses on taxpayers who are going to be left holding the bag. But the bottom line on the economic data for the week was that all of it seems to undermine the idea that the economy is recovering. Yet the investors are oblivious to it anyway, because you continue to see strength in the dollar, weakness in gold, all predicated on a tighter Fed, which again is conditioned or contingent on the U.S. economic recovery, even though the evidence that we continue to see shows to the extent that we had a recovery, it's unraveling 
And anybody thinking clearly would have to understand that, well, what is the Fed going to do if the economy or if the economic recovery is in jeopardy or if, in fact, we're back in recession? And that is print more money, more quantitative easing, the opposite of what everybody seems to be expecting. The Peter Schiff Show. Well, you know, there's no shortage of people trying to claim victory in the inflation debate and uh, basically exonerate the Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, and and say guys like me, Peter Schiff, although most people don't want to mention me by name. They talk about inflationists or people who were warning us. Uh, Usually my name doesn't come up unless I'm actually involved in the discussion. Like I was on CNBC on Friday and I did have a debate with somebody about inflation and and there they'll say, well, Peter, you know, you've been warning about inflation. But normally when I'm not actually on the air, specifically in the discussion, they never mention me by name, but they, they may be thinking about me. Maybe they just don't want to give me any extra publicity, even when they're criticizing me. But they talk in general about people who have been warning about inflation to say that, you know, we've been wrong because, you know, there obviously haven't been any negative consequences from the Fed and all this money printing. And of course, I would argue with that. I think there are many negative consequences. I think the bubbles that have been inflated in the stock market and real estate market are negative consequences. It just doesn't feel like it right now. Just like the stock market bubble and the real estate bubbles that we had before didn't feel like a problem. Nobody felt in 2004 or 2005 or 2006 that the real estate bubble was a problem. I mean, they didn't even know it was a bubble. But nobody other than me and a few other people were saying these high real estate prices are a problem. It is distorting the economy. Right? There is too much debt, too much leverage. There's going to be a big price to pay. Nobody recognized that. So there is a big price to pay from current Fed policy. In fact, in my interview on CNBC, the guy that I was debating, and I forget the guy's name, but he says, well, Peter, you know, when are you going to admit that you were wrong about this? You've been warning about all the problems that we were going to have from all this money printing and we haven't had it, right? So when are you going to admit it? And, and, and I said, look, first of all, I identify these things as problems. I think inflating a stock market bubble or a real estate bubble is a problem. I think inflating a government bubble, I think enable the government to borrow a lot of money that it can't repay is a problem. So I think there's a problem right now, right? Whether you're not going to associate that with it with the fact that it's a problem because it doesn't feel like it yet because the consequences it's like you know you don't necessarily know that drinking a lot of alcohol is a problem while you're drinking maybe you feel pretty good while you're consuming all the alcohol the problem is later on when you're when you're hung over and you're vomiting uh you know in a toilet bowl right worshiping the porcelain god you know okay now you realize it's a problem The key is to recognize the problem while you're drinking so you can stop. So you don't end up, you know, uh, hunched over a toilet bowl, uh, you know, you know, swearing never to have another drink again. Right. That's the whole idea. So I'm not wanting to get to that point. But what I said to this guy in the interview was, look, you know, when I'll admit that I'm wrong, when the Fed raises interest rates back to normal, And when the Fed shrinks its balance sheet back to normal, when the Fed unloads all these bonds and all these mortgages, if the Fed can do all that and then everything is okay, right, then I will admit that I was wrong. And of course, this guy says, well, why should we, why should they have to do that? Why should you be able to come up with this, you know, litmus test of when, I said, it's not my litmus test. That's what the Fed promised us, that this was all temporary, that they were going to expand the balance sheet as an emergency and then contract it that they were going to put interest rates down temporarily and then let them go back to normal. So it's not my arbitrary litmus test. This is what the fed promised us. And of course, the reason that there's still confidence in the fed confidence in the dollar, the reason we can still sell treasury bonds is because everybody believes 
that the Fed was being honest, that it is temporary, that they are going to raise interest rates and that they are going to shrink the balance sheet. You see, it's my position that that can never happen. It's my argument that the reason it's been five or six years of this phony recovery and the reason that rates are still at zero is because the Fed can't raise them. The reason they're always talking about raising rates in the future is because they can never raise rates in the present. They have to maintain the illusion that they'll raise them in the future. But whenever the future becomes the present, then they have to postpone the rate hikes to some you know, future date. And so if the Fed can succeed in unwinding all this, and if it doesn't collapse the economy, if we don't get a stock market collapse, a bond market collapse, if it doesn't force the banks into failure, if it doesn't force the government into default, if the Fed can pull off this miracle, well, then I'll come out and say, I guess I was wrong. But until they complete the exit, all of these victory laps being taken by all the, the, the cheerleaders for the Federal Reserve, it's all premature. It's, a, it's again, it's like congratulating the pilot for a safe flight before he lands. Right. Yeah, he took off and we're in the air, but you don't congratulate him until the guy lands. Because what if he doesn't know how to land? And I've said that about the Federal Reserve. They have no idea how to land this plane, yet they want to take credit for a safe flight while the plane is still mid-flight. No, get the plane on the ground and get all the passengers out alive and then, you know, ask for a round of applause. But if you have no idea how to land the plane and you're just flying it around until you run out of gas because you don't want to admit to the passengers that you don't have the faintest idea how to land this thing. In fact, it's impossible because we have a plane. There's no landing gear. It is you even even if the pilot knew how to land the plane, it's impossible. So you know we're just going to make up all these excuses. But eventually, you know, we will run out of gas, and the plane is going to come down, and that is going to happen. But all this victory stuff, we got an interview with Paul Krugman in Princeton Magazine. Right again, you know, taking credit for having been right and other guys having been wrong. One of the interesting things about this interview is that Paul Krugman talks about the ideal rate of inflation that he wants, right, that he thinks we should have, because he thinks 2% is too low, right? And he basically says that he wants 4% inflation, 4%. Now, maybe Paul Krugman doesn't even know this, but when Richard Nixon first imposed wage and price controls, not that they were justified or not that they would have worked, they didn't, but he imposed wage and price controls because inflation was such a big problem that he, ha- he needed to do something drastic, even though that solution wouldn't solve the problem and didn't solve the problem. And ultimately, inflation got worse and they had to get rid of the wage and price controls because it attacks the symptom of the disease and not the disease. In fact, if you attack the system, the symptom, and do nothing about the disease, the disease gets worse. And so ultimately, so do the symptoms, which is what happened. But the level of CPI inflation that was so high that it resulted in um, wage and price controls was 4%. 4%. In fact, when we had the wind buttons, I think there were years when Gerald Ford had his whip inflation now. That was about where inflation was. And Paul Grugman says that's where we wanted to be. And of course, you know, if the CPI were to get to 4% from 2%, which is where it is now, Right. That would be a doubling in the official rate of inflation. Well, if the official rate of inflation doubles, the unofficial rate of inflation will probably also double. And who knows where the unofficial rate of inflation is, but that is the inflation that everybody is dealing with. So if you think that prices are rising fast now with 2 percent CPI. Imagine, imagine how much faster it would be if we got official inflation of twice what it is now, because that would mean that the unofficial prices, the prices for food and energy and health care and uh, insurance and rents and all the things that you pay. If you're upset at the increases that you're seeing now, what if the prices were rising twice, twice as fast? 
because that's what Paul Krugman wants. And of course, also, you know, in this interview that he gave, he says he also is in favor of the minimum wage going up. He wants a 10-10 minimum wage. But he all he wants inflation of 4%. You know, you take that 4% every year and compound it. And especially if you're talking about the official rate and if the unofficial rates are so much higher, who does Paul Krugman think would be most negatively impacted? Whose standard of living has the most to lose by a big increase in inflation? The people that he thinks he's helping with a higher minimum wage. Of course, he's not helping them at all. In, in some cases, he's helping them to an unemployment check. But he's, he's subjecting everybody who works for the minimum wage, if you haven't lost your job, to a rising cost of living. And of course, if he's advocating 4% interest rates, how can they keep, I mean, 4% inflation, how can they keep interest rates so low? He doesn't want to raise interest rates. How can you have 4% inflation, yet interest rates at zero? How can you have the 10-year government bond yielding 2.5% when there's 4% inflation? Who's going to be dumb enough to buy that bond? So if you're advocating for 4% inflation, then you have to be advocating for much higher nominal interest rates, which Paul Krugman is not. He wants to keep interest rates low. So in other words, he wants to steal money from bondholders. But of course, if the bondholders were convinced that the rate of inflation that Krugman is advocating was going to be there, they wouldn't be bondholders. They would be bond sellers, which would mean the Federal Reserve would have to print even more money to buy up all the bonds that nobody wanted because inflation was too high, which of course would drive inflation even higher. So of course, if the government wants 4% inflation, but they also want to keep interest rates very low, they're going to end up with an inflation rate considerably higher then 4%, then of course the government is going to be robbing people blind. Now, it's not just, you know, Paul Krugman, the guy I was debating. I watched an interview with Henry Blodgett. And Henry Blodgett, if you remember Henry, he was one of the biggest cheerleaders during the dot-com bubble. He had a buy recommendation on every overpriced, hyped up internet stock out there in 1999. He was the poster boy. And of course, the market collapsed and he didn't have a sell on anything. And anybody who followed Blodgett's advice lost a lot of money. They made some money for a while, right? But when the music stopped, they weren't sitting in chairs because Blodgett didn't encourage anybody, right, to, to, get, to get out while the music was still playing. He kept everybody fully invested. And uh, if you followed his advice, you followed it at your own peril. And whatever paper profits you may have enjoyed early on, everything was lost. Anyway, Blodgett has kind of reemerged in the last few years. He's now, I've interviewed with the guy. He works at uh, Yahoo Finance. And so he was interviewed just the other day talking about Krugman, talking about inflation, not mentioning me by name, but again, talking about these uh, right-wing you know, extremists or maybe uh, religious fanatics when it comes to inflation and paper money and how we were warning about uh, inflation and how we've been dead wrong. First, let's hear where he basically says that all the guys like me were dead wrong, right? Have a listen. Bernanke doesn't deserve all the credit, but he deserves a lot of credit. And one thing that Krugman talks about is the refusal of the religious hard money crowd who have been saying for the last six years that we're going to be overwhelmed by inflation, this right. terrible money printing is going to ruin everything. That has been 100 percent wrong. Full stop. Yeah. No argument. I mean, 100 <laughs> percent wrong. And Bernanke saying, and Krugman saying from the beginning, actually, no, we do not have the same pressures. We're in this deflation trap. You can go ahead and stomp on the gas, get the money out there, bring interest rates down, and we're not going to have this huge inflation that's going to crush everybody, so forth. So it's 100% wrong, and it's time for people to admit that. Now, of course, we're not wrong. Inflation has done a lot of damage to the economy. It's damage that Blodgett doesn't necessarily understand, or maybe he even does. But 
He doesn't appreciate the extent of the damage the inflation has caused, just like he didn't appreciate it in the 1990s when I was warning about the stock market bubble that he denied existed and he was cheerleading the new economy. He didn't understand how bad monetary policy was feeding all those malinvestments, nor did he understand the ramifications uh, when what they were going to be when the bubble blew up. But we do have a lot of problems that have resulted from the aggressive monetary policy of the last five years, the least of which is that the Fed has backed itself into a box from which there's no exit. Because now that the Fed has got the economy so levered up and so addicted to cheap money, they can't stop. So that is the biggest problem is that there's no no way out. They've committed to this and they can't get out of it. Blodgett just assumes that they can, even though it hasn't happened. And he's saying, well, you know, we haven't had the inflation. Prices have gone up, not just for financial assets, which is still a problem. If you have asset prices that don't reflect their fundamental value, and if decisions are being made based on this, right, then you're doing damage. In fact, here, have a listen. He does. He does acknowledge even though he thinks that there's no price inflation, he does acknowledge that there could be some malinvestments associated with asset bubbles. He acknowledges that, but claims that that's got nothing to do with inflation. Here, listen. You can say that, okay, all these super low interest rates are distorting the economy. They are encouraging speculation. They are a big reason why the stock market is where it is. Absolutely, yes. Which, interestingly, a lot of the people who are just foaming at the mouth about how horrible it is that Bernanke is doing what he's doing are benefiting from. It's sort of an odd conjunction of things that are going on. You can argue that, and there's a lot of truth to that. We got into trouble with a housing bubble because we encouraged speculation with low interest rates for years and years and years and years. Now we're encouraging speculation with free money for hedge funds and everybody else who wants to buy back their own stock and so forth. That is boosting the stock market. You can definitely say that is distorting things and that there is going to be a bill to pay. But the inflation story is dead wrong. That has everything to do with inflation. It is the inflation that is inflating the asset bubbles. Without the cheap money, the bubbles wouldn't have any air. Right? They couldn't get any bigger. But prices are rising. I just read this article just a few days ago about the big increase in dairy prices this year. I mean, you know, Milk prices, cheese prices, egg prices. I mean, across the board, all the ingredients to make a pizza, by the way, bread too, are going way up. Um, prices are rising. Rents are rising. Right? Prices for all sorts of things, even according to the government. Even the government's CPI is at 2%. So if prices are 2% higher than they were last year, that's still a problem, especially if you're unemployed, especially if your wages are falling. You know, we would have had some relief what if market forces would have brought prices down by 5%? But because the Fed printed all this money, instead of prices being 5% lower, they're 2% higher. That's still 7% inflation or 7% prices are 7% higher than they would have been had the Fed not printed all this money. So what damage is that doing? It's robbing people of the benefit of being able to buy something for less money. Right. So it's still doing damage. But again, a lot of the inflation is being exported. But of course, one of the main reasons that we can get away with it is because we're not doing this in a vacuum. Right. The Japanese, the Europeans, the Chinese, everybody is printing a lot of money and creating a lot of inflation. And so that is diffusing uh, the negative impact in the United States. If we were doing this on our own, if we were the only nation embarking on this suicide type, uh, you know, monetary path, if we were doing this on our own, then, uh, you know, we would be feeling the full sting of the policy. But since we're not, since other people are acting recklessly, and again, America temporarily benefits. People are worried about Europe. They're worried about Japan. What do they do? They buy dollars. You know, I'm watching today and I'm going to talk you know, again, about the, the the markets and the currency markets. But I'm listening on CNBC today on Friday because the dollar has strengthened all week. And they're talking about how is a strong dollar going to hurt the U.S. economy? I mean, what are the negatives? Without even realizing that the whole phony economy is dependent 
on that strong dollar, that the fact that dollar being stronger on a relative basis, that's what's perpetuating the illusion of economic growth. Because if the dollar were to collapse, the, the illusion would collapse along with it. So this is actually perpetuating the phony growth that everybody believes is legitimate. But, you know, I said Krugman wanted 4% inflation. Well, Henry Blodgett is one-upping him because he admits that the Federal Reserve wants to create inflation. He, he admits that they don't want to acknowledge it, but that's their agenda. So I got to give him credit for at least getting that little part of it right. But listen to him uh, explain, you know, why he thinks the Fed wants inflation, but is reluctant to admit it. Here. We still have slack in the labor market. And the thing that nobody at the Fed can ever admit because they will be chased out of town with pitchforks is the Fed actually does want a little bit higher inflation. Yeah, absolutely. Than it says. Yes. And yeah. why? So we can actually start working off this huge pile of debt that right. we have amassed. And it's no coincidence that a lot of the folks who are saying Bernanke is destroying the economy are the folks who are actually lending the money, getting lower interest rates. They don't want the value of the principal hurt by inflation going forward. So they're speaking from self-interest. Right. It if is you're, not if you're about a creditor, inflation is not good for, for you. Economy, yes. Whatever. Yes. It is pure self-interest. Understandable. You don't want your money destroyed. Right. But the Fed does want to be behind the curve. They have to say all day long, oh, never, never, never. We're going to be so hard on it. They don't want inflation to get wildly out of control like in the 1970s. But we certainly want to run 5 6%, something well above the 2 Now, of course, when he says that, you know, they're, they're trying to manage this debt, right? They're trying to uh, retire the debt or handle all the debt by inflating it away, what he really means is they don't want to repay the debt legitimately. They want to default, but they don't have the integrity to do it honestly. So they want to create inflation so they can pretend to pay off the debt, but in fact not pay it off because they're repaying it with inflated currency, with currency of debased value, which is the same thing as defaulting, right? You repay your obligations, but not in the same purchasing power as when you barred it. But the amazing thing is, listen to the rate of inflation that he claims he wants. Five to six percent, not the four percent that that Krugman says would be ideal. Blodgett is actually advocating annual inflation rates of five to six percent as if that would be a good thing. And of course, the interest rates have to stay where they are, they can't go up to seven or eight percent to imply a real rate of return because the government can't afford to make those nominal payments. Neither can homeowners, neither would corporations. So the government wants or Blodgett wants the Federal Reserve, the government to be able to steal five or six percent of a saver's wealth every year. If you're a bondholder, if you got money to CD, he thinks that it would be ideal, it would be good for the economy to just confiscate through inflation 5 to 6% of your principal uh, purchasing power on an annualized basis. Now, I mean, very few people would agree that 5 to 6% inflation is desirable, let alone that it wouldn't be a huge problem. And it's interesting that he says, look, we don't want a crazy rate of inflation. We don't want runaway inflation. We just want five or six percent. Five or six percent inflation leads to runaway inflation if you don't do anything about it. In fact, even if you could control inflation and stop it at five or six percent, it's not like you can tell people, hey, don't worry. It's only going to be five or six percent. So don't worry about it. I mean, if you told somebody we're going to steal 5% of your money every year, but don't worry about it because I'm only going to steal 5%, you're not going to necessarily say, okay, because A, 5% is not that small, but B, 5% a year, every year, year after year after year, pretty soon there's nothing left. So you can't expect people to just take that line down. You can't say, hey, just it's going to be 5 or 6%, but live with it. No, because once you accept that it's 5 or 6%, you're not going to live with it. You're going to want to live without it, which means inflation is going to end up being a lot worse than 5 or 6%. It will not stop until the Fed slams on the brakes. See, he says 
um, Blasio says the Fed wants to stay behind the curve. But they can't stay behind the curve. If they ever want to stop inflation from getting out of control, they've got to get ahead of the curve. If they stay behind the curve, they will continue to fall further and further behind the curve. And the further behind the curve they fall, the further out in front of it they're going to have to get in order to stop the process, which, of course, they can't do. And if the Fed tried to stop the runaway inflation from going out of control, then Henry would finally figure out, too late, of course, the same way he figured it out with the dot-coms, but then he would figure out why I've been right the entire time, and so have other people who said the Fed never should have gone down this route. I said it from day one. I said it from QE1 before they even called it QE1 because they didn't know there was going to be a QE2. I said that they checked into a monetary roach motel, right? I said that then because I knew they could never get out. You don't want to check into a hotel that you can't check out of. That's the problem. Guys like Blodgett, guys like um, um, Krugman or the guy that I was debating on CNBC, they, they, they are clinging to the illusion that the Fed could leave anytime it wants and it's not going to be a problem. It's, it, it, they can't leave, which is precisely why they haven't. Even Blodgett, the guy asked Blodgett, you know, well, you know, why have they stayed so loose so long? I mean, if clearly the economy is getting better, why do we still need emergency support? And that's when he, you know, kind of lets loose, well, the Fed really just wants more inflation. But the reality is it's not that they want it. They need it. They need it to sustain the illusion of economic growth. They need it to sustain the asset bubbles. And they need it to delay the day of reckoning. Because the Fed doesn't want to end the monetary stimulus. It doesn't want to have to start raising rates, so it can't. So it has to per, uh, pursue this policy indefinitely. It has to make up one excuse after another why it can't uh, raise rates or end the policy because it can't admit the truth that it's in for the duration, right? That they're all in 100% inflation. In fact, the commentary that I wrote this week on the Europac website is all about this fact, about the fact that they are betting the farm on inflation. And it's not just the Fed, right? It's, it's Europe, it's Japan. Everybody is printing money based on the fact that we just need more inflation and that's going to solve our economic problems. And nobody is concerned about what happens if we get more inflation, but we don't solve any of the problems. In fact, what happens if we get more inflation and as a result, the problems that we're trying to solve are actually made worse. And now we've got an inflation problem on top of an employment problem and an economic growth problem. And now what are we going to do? Right. Because how are we going to fight the inflation problem without making the other problems much, much worse that we thought inflation was going to solve? Because if the world's central banks are in a box now and they think, well, we need to lower interest rates. What kind of box are they going to be in when they're forced to jack interest rates way up? If they say they're too high now, even though they're near record lows, what's going to happen when they actually really have to start raising interest rates? In fact, what are they doing right now in, uh, in Japan? Japan this week, for the first time, bought uh, bonds at a negative, at a negative rate of interest. And... I'm going to tell you what that means because they're also talking about Switzerland. Switzerland is also talking about, or they're writing about this, uh, negative rates in Switzerland as well. So I'm going to talk more about that coming up. The Peter Schiff Show. So for the first time ever, right, the Bank of Japan is buying JGBs at a negative yield. Now, what does that mean? And what, what is the significance? Basically, what that means is they're buying, let's say the bond matures, and at maturity, you get a million yen. They're paying less than a million yen. Maybe they're paying 900,990. They're paying something less than maturity and they're receiving no interest, let's say, between the time they buy it and the time it matures, which means that they are losing money on every bond that they buy, which means that their balance sheet is deteriorating by buying the bond. See, normally when a central bank 
buys a bond, whether they're buying, you know, a government bond or whatever they're buying, the bond becomes an asset on the balance sheet of that central bank. The liability to offset it is the currency they created to buy it. But the liability and the assets match. So if the Bank of Japan buys a million yen worth of bonds and it pays a million yen, then it has an asset and a liability that match each other. Now, of course, it earns an interest rate. So from its open market operations, it generates some kind of positive cash flow. The same thing, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve buys a treasury, buys a million dollars worth of treasuries. It creates a million dollars worth of Federal Reserve notes. The dollars are the liability. The treasury bond is the asset. The assets equal liability. And the central bank is enriched by the positive uh, rate of return that it earns on its on its asset, right? Because it's it's not paying anything on its liability. It doesn't pay any interest. When it gives you the dollars, it's really not paying anything. But it's earning an interest rate. It's getting a, The government is paying a coupon on, on the bond, right? Or if it's buying a treasury bill, it's buying it at a discount, and the interest is baked into the, to the yield. But what Japan is doing is they're not buying the treasury. They're not buying the bond at, an, at a discount. They're buying it at a premium, and they're losing money. And what this shows you is Japan is, is, is even further along in this inflationary process because now their central bank is destroying value and creating permanent liquidity that can never be absorbed because the balance sheets won't have the asset. If they ever want to take away the liquidity, even in theory, they can't take it all away because their assets don't match their liabilities. And of course, if they're going to continue on this path, they're going to have to pay more and more prices, I mean, higher and higher prices, which means earning a greater negative return on every Japanese government bond that they buy. And in fact, in in Switzerland, I'm reading articles about how Switzerland might have to pursue a similar policy. The Swiss franc, along with pretty much all the currencies, got beaten up this week. But when the Swiss are threatening to print a bunch of Swiss francs because they have to defend the peg against the euro, they're not really defending the franc, they're defending the euro. And Switzerland's economy is not bad. They don't have an unemployment problem. They have very low unemployment. They have good economic growth. So why do they have to create all this inflation? It's not about helping the Swiss economy. It's about bailing out the European economy by exposing the weakness in the euro because the Europeans would want to put their money into Swiss francs rather than dollars. But since the Swiss central bank was dumb enough to peg its currency to the euro, then the euro is not providing the relief that Europeans would would seek out. And so they have to seek out an alternative safe haven. Now, maybe this nonsense... This big drop in the Swiss franc, and of course, that's going to lead to more inflation in Switzerland. It's going to cause the Swiss government to have to buy even more euros, which means if this uh, referendum passes in November that we talked about last week on on gold reserves, it means even more gold that the Swiss are going to have to buy uh, to have gold 20 percent of their reserves. And maybe all this talk about negative interest rates and printing even more Swiss francs, will get some Swiss to the polls to try to put an end to this nonsense. Maybe this is one of the only examples of where democracy could work. See, normally you don't want to do what the people want because the people want to do dumb things. But in this case, the dumbest things are being done by the leaders. The, The officials in Switzerland are acting irresponsibly. Maybe the voters can come in and apply some discipline. Maybe in this case, the direct democracy approach will actually work because you can't imagine doing something dumber than what the Swiss government is doing right now in the Swiss central bank as far as just trying to print all this money to prevent the euro from collapsing. And why should the Swiss have to be made to suffer uh, from the mistakes that are being made in France and Spain and places like that? In fact, the French government just came out and said this week that they're not going to be able to meet their commitment to reduce their budget deficits down to 3% of GDP because they said they can't do it because economic growth is too slow and inflation is too low. They actually listed inflation being too low as one of the problems that, oh, we can't balance our budget. We would do it, but we have an inflation problem. The inflation is too low. And because inflation is too low, we have to have bigger deficits. Why? Low inflation actually makes it easier for the 
the French, because if their people aren't having to pay, you know, higher prices, then maybe they can raise their taxes or cut some of their benefits to help balance the budget. If inflation were creating more economic misery, you would think that might be a reason. Oh, we can't balance the budget because we have this inflation problem we have to deal with. No, as far as they're concerned, it's not an inflation problem. They, they're basically been given an inflation lifeline in the form of inflation being lower. And they want to say that that's the problem that we're worried about. We can't balance the budget until we have higher inflation. And again, they're saying, well, our economy, our economic growth is too weak. Maybe one of the reasons it's too weak is because government spending is too much. Maybe balancing the budget and cutting back the size of government, maybe that would actually free up the economy. Again, I talked about that on the, the last week's podcast. What Europe needs is less government, not more inflation and more money printing. If they want to have a more vibrant economy that produces more tax revenue, they need to unshackle it, not tie it up uh, with government spending and inflation. But all of this is negative for uh, the euro and by definition or extension the Swiss franc, which is tied to the euro, the British pound, although that might have been the weakest of the European currencies on the week, uh, that may, that was triggered or the extra weakness was triggered by a new poll because the Scottish are going to be voting for independence uh, from the UK next week. And there was a poll that came out to show that the yes votes, meaning yes, we want to be independent, had a slight lead over the no votes. And that sent the, the pound, uh, uh, you know, falling sharply. Now, personally, I don't think that they're going to vote for independence. I think that there's going to be a push uh, by all the powers that be to scare the hell out of the Scots and, and, and make sure that uh, the the no's outnumber the yeas, but it's a very interesting uh, situation to contemplate, and not only why the Scots might want to be independent from the UK, but there are a lot of other uh, you know smaller uh, governments that might want to be independent of a larger entity, particularly when there's a lot of debt. Because one of the questions surrounding Scottish independence, and there's many, it's not just the debt. But what would happen to the British national debt? Would the Scottish have their proportionate share of it? I mean, I would think not, because Scotland is not obligated to repay British debt. Britain is. And of course, if I loan money to Britain, I'm not going to want Britain to just unload that obligation on some other country. If I loan money to Britain, I expect it to be paid back from Britain. They can't tell me, well, you loaned it to us, but get it back from the Scots. Because the Scots could say, hey, we didn't borrow it. Don't expect us to pay it back. So all the debt would really fall on the British, but it would let the Scots off the hook. Now, the question is, what type of country would an independent Scotland be? Of course, if Scotland, as an independent nation, were to go into a Singapore direction, right, and say we're going to have low taxes, less welfare, then it would be a big plus for the Scots to get out from under British socialism and to get out from under their share of the British debt. Even if it meant launching their own currency or uh, adopting another currency, they would be better off. Now, of course, if Scotland becomes an even bigger welfare state than the UK, it all depends on how they self-govern themselves. Uh, but one thing is they would be out from under, theoretically, is they can get out from under the debt. And I think you're going to find a lot more uh, people around the world when interest rates eventually go up. I mean, right now, interest rates are very, very low. And so as big as these debt burdens are, right, we ain't seen nothing yet. But when interest rates go up and when people are faced with massive tax increases or massive inflation in order to service the enormity of the debt, I think you're going to have a lot more pressure, not only in Europe, but in the United States. I mean, I think you're going to have big movements in the United States. States are going to want to get out. I mean, you're talking about, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the Scots wanting out of the UK. What about, what about Texas, for example? You're talking about a red state, uh, you know, governed by a bunch of uh, Democrats. They, they don't have their own state income tax. What if all of a sudden taxes are having to be jacked up dramatically to pay all these welfare benefits? And this, we don't want any part of it. You know, and it's not. So I think you're going to see a lot of this type of pressure, even if the Scots you know, vote this thing down now. I mean, this referendum could come up again, especially if it's, you know, if it's very close, if it loses, you know, by a very, very thin margin. 
Um, but in the meantime, the uncertainty surrounding how this is going to play out, what it means to uh, the British pound, you know, uh, is weighing on the currency. And that is also propping up the dollar. In fact, the strength in the dollar is spilling over into all the currencies. This week, the dollar strong against the commodity currencies, big drops in the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar. Dollar index now is trading all the way back up uh, above 84. Again, though, 84, it's, we're not 110, 120. I mean, that's where we were 1999, 2000. So we're nowhere near that level. Uh, and in fact, up until 2008, the lowest the dollar index ever traded was 80. So all these guys that are out there, you know, talking about how strong the dollar is, how strong the dollar is, have a little perspective. It's not really strong. It's, it's less weak. It's not on the absolute low that it's been uh, in its history. And of course, the Japanese yen, too, on the back of those negative interest rates, we did have new multi-year lows in the Japanese yen. And all of this, the weakness in the yen, the weakness in the euro, the weakness in the Aussie, all of this is buying us some extra time because it enables Americans to spend more, to buy more, to borrow more. Not that any of that is helping our economy. All of that is undermining, undermining our economy, but it keeps the balls in the air a little longer. And guys like Henry Blodgett or or Paul Krugman, can pretend that everything is great and pretend that guys like me are wrong, right? Because all of this, uh, you know, safe haven flight money is taking refuge in the dollar, even though, even though the problems in America are bigger than the problems in the nations where people are fleeing with their money, right? They're, they're selling euros or they're selling pounds or they're selling yen to buy dollars because they're worried about problems in Europe or Japan, even though, we have the same problems, only bigger in the United States. And as more and more economic data comes out to undermine the case for this vibrant economic recovery and a tighter Fed, what does everybody do? They ignore it. But they can only ignore the facts for so long. Eventually, they're going to come out and it's going to hit people like a ton of bricks on the head. And I think you're going to see a big reversal in uh, the dollar, in the commodity markets, in, in, in the gold and silver market, uh, because all these markets are moving in a direction based on Fed policy that isn't going to happen, based on interest rate hikes that are not going to occur. Now, that doesn't mean the Fed is never going to raise rates. They will eventually, but not because they want to, but because they have to. And believe me, there will be dire circumstances that will force the Fed to raise rates. I mean, this guy that I was debating and they said, oh, well, rates are only going to go up if we have a really, really strong economy. No, rates are not going to go up because the economy is so strong. It's because inflation is out of control. It's because there's a loss of confidence. In fact, it's impossible for the current U.S. economy to be strong if interest rates go up, because if interest rates go up, whatever economic strength we had will be lost. It's like, you know, it's like Samson and his hair. It's like saying it's expecting Samson to still be strong after he, after he has a crew cut. You, you, you take away his hair and you take away his strength. We can't have a strong economy with with uh, with with high interest rates. It's like cutting off our hair, you know, and, and expecting expecting the strength to be there. It won't. The Peter Schiff Show. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? 
If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies. The Peter Schiff Show. It's, it's a what this supposed to be, you know. Well, once again, we've got allegations of racism regarding the NBA. And I'm reading a report about it in the New York Times. And this is how the New York Times titles this story. Searching for a league's true scale of bigotry. Right. So how much racism, how much bigotry really exists in the NBA? And the subtitle is Bruce Levinson's email reveals depth of NBA racism issues. Now, in the article, they actually publish a link where you can see the email that Bruce Levinson actually sent, right? And because of this email, right, he is now being forced or he's volunteering to sell his um, his share, his interest in the Atlanta Hawks, right? That is the basketball team in which he was the controlling owner, investor. And as a result of this email surfacing, he is agreeing to sell his his share. Now, you know, there's some speculation that maybe he is trying to exploit the public's outrage because maybe he wants to sell. And maybe by claiming, well, I have to sell, that he might be able to claim a tax break, which maybe even Donald Sterling will get. As in the Internal Revenue Code, if you're forced to sell an asset against your will, you can defer the capital gains by purchasing some type of similar asset with the money and then postpone the um, the taxes. Just like with a 1031 exchange where you, where you sell some real estate at a game, but then you buy other real estate, a similar property, and you don't have to pay a tax. And, and this would have the benefit of being able to diversify out of probably a very, very overpriced asset now that you saw the Clippers sell for $2 billion. Uh, so maybe Levinson is thinking, I can get some type of high valuation also for my ownership interest in the Hawks. So I don't know, you, you, you can be a little bit suspicious as to the motivation, but I think the email was going to come out eventually anyway. But what I'm really concerned about is how the New York Times in this article is reacting to it because they put a link to the actual email and there is nothing racist about it. Nothing. Now, do does he talk about race? Does he talk about black and white? Yes, he talks about it. But so just mentioning blacks and whites means that you're racist because you're talking about races? In fact, the only mention of racism in the email is when Levinson actually says that some people are racist and he calls it racist garbage or racist nonsense. He's talking about the racism that he believes may exist in other people, not himself. And he specifically calls that racism garbage. So he's actually, not only is he not being racist, but he is criticizing people who are. Yet somehow the letter is being interpreted as if not only is he a racist, but we got to get rid of him. We got to get him out of the NBA and we got to get all of his racist, uh, you know, kind out. Now, what did he write? All right. Here's the observation that he made. OK, he owns a company and he wants to maximize his profits. And one of the problems that he identifies at the Hawks is that they are selling very few season tickets. And season tickets is where uh, a lot of the the clubs make a lot of money because they have these season ticket holders who buy the tickets and, you know, you don't, you know, they're sold for the season, right? Also corporate sponsors, corporate boxes, and they're not doing a lot of that at, at the Hawks. Also, their merchandise sale is not what it is at other, um, other venues that he's been associated with. And he also complains that there's not a lot of fathers and sons, not a lot of families coming to the games 
and they're coming late. They're not, you know, they're, they're, a lot of times he says that the, the, the teams are already on the field playing, on the court rather, playing, and people are still coming in. And in other places he's been, uh, they come earlier. And of course, if they come earlier, not only is it better for morale, but they spend more money at concessions. They buy maybe more T-shirts or stuff like that. So he's trying to drive the bottom line. And he notices that the games are, are disproportionately attended by blacks, mainly Black single men, not men bringing their children, but maybe teen, you know, old, you know, man, black men in their twenties and thirties come into the game, and he says the game it's about seventy percent black, seventy percent, and he says that a lot of the bars, right, the bars and restaurants that they have there are ninety percent black, and he's saying that wait a minute, this is a problem, because certainly, I mean, you know, we need to have white people to come to the games. He says, we can't run a sports franchise if we're just appealing to blacks. They just don't have enough affluent blacks for us to exclude, you know, most of the white population. So he's trying to figure out how we can encourage more white attendance at the games so that they can make more money. And somehow, because he wants more white people to come to the games, that is racism. How is that racism? You know, if the games were almost all whites and they said, you know, we need to get some more African-Americans coming to the games, what can we do to make the experience more appealing to African-Americans so we can have more diversity? Nobody would say that's racist. If the games are 70% black, why can't they say we need more diversity? Why can't they say, let's make the games appealing to white people so we can have white people and black people? He's not saying, I don't want blacks to come to the games. He's saying, I want more whites. He doesn't want to lose any of the black fans. He just wants white fans coming too. He's got empty seats. He wants them filled. He wants to get some white people there in addition to the black people. And it's not about racism. It's about the bottom line. Right? Now, he does point out some things. He says, for example, he said the cheerleaders are almost all black. Let's have some white cheerleaders. Well, if they were almost all white and he said, hey, we've got almost all white cheerleaders, let's have some black cheerleaders, would anybody be saying he was a racist because he pointed out that we have almost all white cheerleaders and maybe we should have a couple of black ones? Well, if it turns out they're almost all black, why can't they have a couple of white ones? If he thinks maybe some white people might come to the game if there were some white cheerleaders. I don't know. That's, that's probably the smallest of the points. He mentioned that the music was almost all hip-hop and gospel. And he said, look, maybe we can play some music that might appeal to a broader audience. You know, we, we, want, we need to get some white guys. We need to sell tickets to some white people because we need to make money. You know, it's not racist. Now, one thing he says, which I guess really has them all freaking out, is he mentions the fact that he thinks maybe the high proportion of blacks at these games, particularly, you know, black males, is scaring away some of the white ticket holders. And this is where he says, look, I think it's a bunch of racist nonsense because we don't have any evidence that shows that there's a lot of crime. Uh, in the in at the stadium because of you know if there's any more crime at the Hawks games that are 70 percent black than any other uh, NBA teams where the percentage of blacks are maybe five or ten or twenty percent right he's not saying that we notice a lot of crime but he's mentioning that maybe other people perceive a greater risk of crime and therefore they're staying away and he also says that maybe some white people are uncomfortable being a minority, right? That blacks are certainly used to that. I mean, if you're in the minority and you go someplace and it's predominantly white and you're in the minority, that might not be as uncomfortable for somebody who is used to being in the minority. He's speculating maybe some white people are uncomfortable going someplace that's 70% black or going to a bar that's 90% black. They may just feel that, you know, uncomfortable and not want to go there. And, you know, on the crime thing, we all know statistically that young black males commit a disproportionate amount of crime. And so people being fearful of crime and wanting to stay away from areas that are predominantly young black men, that's not even an irrational fear. Even if the crime isn't taking place, 
being fearful of it isn't irrational. And obviously he's saying, if we could just get more white people here, then maybe more white people will come because it, it, they won't have this perception. And I can tell you that if you are a white guy in uh, some place that's 70% black, and if there is a criminal who's looking to pick somebody's pocket, for example, or mug somebody, you probably have a greater chance of being mugged as the white guy, right? Because the muggers might be more likely to think as the white guy that maybe you'll have more money in your pocket. Maybe your wallet will have more bills because they might think, well, here's a white guy. Maybe he's wealthier than the typical black fan, which wouldn't be a bad assessment, right? Because they're dealing in probabilities too. And if you're the white guy that comes into the game, they might think, well, gee, there's a better chance if I, if I steal that wallet rather than just stealing the wallet of a random black guy, I'll probably get more money. If you believe that whites on average earn more than blacks, which they do, and maybe they're from a more affluent community, then maybe if I steal this guy's wallet, I'll get more money than if I steal uh, a, somebody, a black guy's wallet. So it, it makes sense that maybe the whites would feel, well, I have a better chance of being robbed if I'm going to show up. And so he's just trying to figure out how to solve this problem uh, of not making enough money, right? Not selling enough season tickets, not selling enough merchandise, not getting as ma- enough families. He says, we want fathers and sons. We don't want people afraid to take their, their children to these games, right? We want families coming to these games as well. We want to sell corporate sponsors. And the fact that they are 70% black, that's something wrong. I mean, they should be selling tickets to uh, white fans. There are plenty of white fans, you know, in fact, I'd, I'd say that most NBA games, uh, the majority, the vast majority of season tickets, even in, you know, in cities that have large black populations, the, you know, it, it's whites that are buying the vast majority of these tickets. Why it's not happening in Atlanta, this guy is trying to figure it out. He's not trying to figure it out because he's a racist. He's trying to figure it out because he's a capitalist, right? There is not a single racist statement in this email. I defy anybody to find one. But apparently just identifying races, talking about races, right? All he's saying is, I want more white people at the game because I want them to spend money. I want them to buy season tickets. I want them to buy corporate events. I want them eating in our restaurants and drinking in our bars. How can we attract white people to these games? Games, And that, that makes them a racist. How? How? It's, you know, you belittle. You know, if you call everybody a racist just because they acknowledge race and they have a discussion that involves race, if you can't do that, if all of a sudden you're a race, then what is what is really your racist mean? What does being a bigot really mean if everybody is one? But this is all an example of this zero tolerance that if you don't immediately jump on this guy and talk about how outraged you are by his racism, then somehow you're a racist for defending him. You know? And speaking about that, you know, I'm also I'm gonna I'm gonna weigh in on this controversy with Ray Rice. Uh, He is the the football player uh, who has now been kicked, banned from the NFL, from the Baltimore Ravens, um, because of an incident uh, where he struck his wife in an elevator. And again, this is a situation not where I'm going to defend domestic violence or defend hitting a woman, because I'm not, but what I'm going to do is point out uh, the hypocrisy And, you know, of this, you know, how you've got to show how much you are against something or how much you support women's rights by just attacking or vilifying uh, something and blowing it way out of proportion just to prove, just to prove uh, your support for a particular uh, group. In this case, it's women, right? It's not, it's not, you know, African-Americans or homosexuals. This is all about women and showing how you support women and how you are against domestic violence. Because somehow, if you're not in favor of banning this guy for the NBA, you are in favor of domestic violence. The Peter Schiff Show. One of the biggest news stories of the week has to do with Ray Rice. And this is the NFL or former NFL player of the Baltimore Ravens, who is now kicked out of not only the Ravens, but the NFL because TMZ leaked uh, 
photographs or a, not a photograph, uh, a film that was captured on a camera in an elevator where the two were vacationing over weekend in Atlantic City. It was a Valentine's Day weekend. They were engaged at the time. They have since married and and had a child. They have a, a beautiful young daughter. Uh, so they're a family. But at the time, they were uh, engaged to one another, and it was Valentine's Day weekend, and they were in Atlantic City. Now, previously, there were some images that were shown where you can see... Uh, Ray Rice dragging his unconscious fiance out of the elevator. He drags her out of the elevator and, you know, it takes, I don't know if it's a minute or so, but then she eventually revives. He's trying to prop her up. And the images of just him dragging her out, you know, kind of caveman style, you know, he's grabbing her and pulling her out, uh, you know, of the elevator, you know, just that image alone, uh, you know, you know, was provoked some outrage and he was, they announced what well, he had been suspended uh, two or three game suspension. And I guess nobody really tried to speculate how she got herself into that state in the first place. I mean, I, I've seen people, you know, in, I, I haven't really been to Atlantic City, but I've been to Las Vegas. I mean, I, I remember last time I was there, there was a woman lying on the floor right outside the elevator. I mean, just dead passed out. Uh, some of her friends were trying to help her, but she was just totally unconscious, just on the floor. I don't think anybody hit her. She just had too much to drink. So just seeing people unconscious uh, in a situation like that is probably pretty common when you're in places where there's lots of drinking. Um, so maybe people thought that she just passed out or something. But then TMZ released the earlier footage that showed how she became unconscious. And of course, this was outrage. Right? When I first heard about it, I, before I'd actually seen the TMZ footage, I was listening in CNBC right, described it, that there was shocking video of Ray Rice punching out his wife and that she, as a result of being punched out, she was unconscious. And I'm thinking, oh my God, he punched her out. I'm thinking like, you know, what'd he give her? You know, left, right, left, hook, you know, uppercut, right, you know, jab, jab, right cross. I mean, oh my God, he, I'm thinking like he punched her out and knocked her unconscious. Then I read another article about how he beat his wife unconscious. I'm like, he beat her. What did he do? I mean, he really beat her up. He repeatedly slugged her and, and she passed out, right? So this is what I'm expecting, right? Because I haven't even seen it yet. Oh my God, this is this shocking video of a guy beating his wife, uh, really abusing her. He's punching her out, you know? And so I actually watched the video. And again, I am not condoning the fact that he hit his wife, right? Regardless of what she may have said or done to provoke it, there are no circumstances where you hit a woman, even if she's attacking you. I mean, you could try to grab her arms, kind of, you know, tie her up and, you know, you, you know, put your arms around her, hold on to her wrists. I mean, generally, a guy can stop a woman. I mean, obviously, you know, maybe she's got a weapon. If she's got a frying pan in her hand or something, it might be a little harder. But when you're an NFL player and your gal is, you know, slapping you, I mean, you, you know, you, you, you have plenty of ways to defend yourself without hitting her. So I'm not condoning the fact that he hit her. But if you look at the video, first of all, you can see the whole thing before they get into the elevator. She slaps him in the face. He doesn't do anything. She slaps him in the face. It's not a hard slap. From what I can tell, it's kind of you know, almost like a, hey, watch out, you know, just kind of, you know, a slap that we, we would normally say is OK, you know, for a woman to slap a guy, it was, you know, in the face just to kind of get his attention. Right. Maybe that's a double standard. We wouldn't want a man slapping a woman, but it seems like it's OK if a woman slaps a guy in the face like that. I mean, it wasn't like a it shouldn't hurt him. It was just kind of, hey, pay attention. You know, you're doing you're saying something that you shouldn't be saying. You're doing something. Be a man. Be a gentleman. I'm just going to give you a little slap in the face to just, you know remind you, right? And so, but she slaps him in the face. They go into the elevator. You can't hear anything, right? Because there's no audio. They're obviously continuing an argument. In fact, they were arguing. That's why she slapped him in the face. It's also late at night. They're going back up to their room. Uh, and so chances are they drank a lot. And in fact, I've since read articles now that they both admit they were totally plastered, right? So they're drinking and they're arguing, Right? And she slaps him in the face. They get into the elevator. They continue to argue. And now you can see they're spitting at each other. I'm not sure who spits at who, you know, but it seems like they're spitting at each other's faces. So this is a serious heated argument about what, who knows? 
And if the fact that they've been drinking, you know, maybe he paid attention to another woman. Maybe she thinks he did when they were, you know, in a casino or at a bar. Who knows what they're fighting over? Couples fight all the time, right? I mean, you know, domestic violence. I mean, policemen in, in, in you know, mostly what they're doing in the evenings is breaking up uh, domestic violence stuff, right? So they're arguing and she slaps him. And then she is seen rushing towards him. She's going in his direction, right? And then the next thing you see, you see a movement of his arm. And then she's obviously hit because she moves rapidly, right? She's, she's knocked down in, in a direction. But you can't tell. I've watched that thing several times. I can't see his hand. I don't know if he hit her with a closed fist or if he slapped her. Now, is that significant? I would think that if he punched her with a closed fist, that would mean he wanted to hurt her a lot more than if he slapped her with an open hand. But the interesting thing is, if you read all the accounts or listen to it, everybody said he punched her. He punched her. He punched her. How do they know? How can they tell? I can't tell. I've watched it several times. In fact, not only don't I know whether he punched her or slapped her, I don't even know if the hand hit her in the face. I can't even see him make contact with her face. Maybe he slapped her in, in the shoulder. He might have hit her, you know, on the top of the arm, right? Because you can see what happens is after he hits her, right, she, she, she falls to the side and then her head hits the metal railing on the side of the, um, of the elevator. That is what knocked her unconscious. Now, the fact that she had been drinking a lot, maybe she was more prone. Maybe if she hadn't had anything to drink, maybe she just would have had a bump on her head. But her head hit this metal railing, and that is what knocked her unconscious. Not the slap or the punch, whatever it was. That's not why she was unconscious. But when they report it, he knocked her out, he punched her unconscious. No, he didn't. He, he may have punched her. More likely, he slapped her. And he did had no way of knowing that the result of that would be that her head would hit that railing and that she would be unconscious. In fact, maybe she was rushing toward him and he was just trying to push her away. I can't tell. But even if you assume the worst case scenario, that he did punch her, right? It's not the punch that knocked her out. It was the, ra- it was where her, the fact that her head hit the rail. Now, again, I'm not defending the fact that he punched her, but did he repeatedly beat her when she hit the ground? Did he keep punching her? Did he get her up against the corner? Of, of the elevator and, and, and beat the crap out of her. I mean, when you're talking about battered women and all these people are saying how she's a battered wife, we don't know that she's a battered wife. We don't even know if he's hit her since. We do know that she married him. She now has a kid with him. I mean, why would she do that? Now everybody say, well, this is how battered women are. Yeah, all women are a bunch of idiots. They stay with guys that beat them. Give her a little credit. Maybe they had this argument. They had a lot to drink. They both said things they didn't mean. They did things they didn't mean. And they made up. They obviously made up. They got married. Right? Now, here is the problem. You've got all these people that want to condone, I mean, they want to condemn uh, what Ray Rice did to a woman. But the woman herself is not condemning it. And where is more damage being done to this woman? Ray Rice, right, who slapped her, maybe punched her in an argument He apologized. Maybe, you know, who knows what he did to make amends for this. He convinced this woman to marry him, right? He can't be all bad. How do we know what her other relationships have been like? Maybe this is the best relationship she's ever had. Maybe that that slap or that punch, maybe that's the only thing that happened. And maybe maybe this is the best she's ever been treated. How do we know? How do we know that all of her other boyfriends, you know, abused her even more? At least this guy married her. I mean, how many black athletes don't even marry the mothers of their children. We don't kick all these guys out of sports for all the babies they have out of wedlock. This guy married a woman and then got her pregnant, right? So, I mean, he's doing a good thing there. Apparently, too, I've read that they both become born-again Christians. They've stopped drinking because they, they, you know, because of how they acted when they were drinking. So they're working on their lives. And now what's happening? Now, because of the outrage, because of the zero tolerance, because everybody has to condemn this man. Because if you don't condemn him, you're condoning domestic violence. You're condoning violence against women, right? Which I'm clearly not doing. But where is this man's wife, right? Where is Janae Palmer? How is she being harmed more? 
by what happened in that elevator or what happened this week. Her husband getting thrown out of his career. He had a $25 million contract or $35 million contract. And obviously, they're married. She gets half that contract, right? That's half her money. You know, where is she hurt more from what happened in that elevator or her husband losing that lucrative job? And what about the little girl? What about their daughter? Doesn't no one cares about her? There are two women that are now suffering. It's not just Ray Rice, right? If this video had come out, if uh, Ray Rice's fiance, Janae, had dumped him as a result of this or other uh, incidents of domestic violence, and he was a single guy, then you can say, okay, we're punishing uh, Ray Rice. But now you're punishing his wife and his daughter. There are two women now that have to suffer. So in order to prove how much you support women, you have to deliberately hurt the lives of these two women. And also, what about their marriage? I mean, if they had difficulties in their marriage, imagine now. I mean, this guy now, it's going to be hard not to resent his wife, even though he shouldn't resent her. I mean, this is how things happen. You know, now he's lost his career. Uh, he feels, you know, less adequate as a man or as a breadwinner. He's, you know, he's been, this is what he's done his whole life. I mean, his marriage is going to be put under a greater strain now than had he, you know, been allowed to play. I mean, it would have been much easier if it wasn't so, oh my God, you know, we, the media has got to blow this out of proportion. We have to condemn this. We have to talk about how outrageous this is. I mean, obviously, there are women getting slapped by their men every day in the United States. Every day. Is it right? No. But it happens. Right. And it happened to this couple. They worked it out. Right. And we can tolerate. Now, I can see, you know, the NFL, the position that the Ravens are in. That, oh, my, we got to get rid of you, because if we don't get rid of you, we're going to get protested. We're going to get boycotts. Our sponsors might pull out. So maybe they're reacting rationally. Maybe they were they were they were put into a box. I'm not saying that it's their fault for reacting to say it's the media and the public and the feigned outrage about how horrible this situation is. Let the guy's wife judge how horrible her husband is. You know, let's not hang this guy in the court of public opinion when we have no idea what happened in that elevator. Yes, he slapped her. Maybe he punched her. It was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. I'm sure he apologized. Maybe he had to buy her some really expensive jewelry to get out of the doghouse. I don't know what he had to do. But it's between them. And yes, I understand how it can be bad publicity. And in the real world, what probably would happen and what would really help, you know, if you're really concerned about domestic violence and spousal abuse, if they would have been allowed to publicly, yes, we went through counseling and he could have talked about how I, I really regret what I did and it was terrible, but now I got counseling, I got help and I haven't done it since and I'm a better man and you know I'm a good father and we have a loving relationship. That might have been more, uh, you know, done more uh, uh, to advance the anti, uh, you know, violence against women cause than to simply try to have this zero tolerance, kick them out, you know. Now, I don't know, maybe they have some kind of plan. Maybe we'll let the dust settle. We'll bring you back in a year. You can have some kind of counseling. But who knows what's going to happen between now and then between the family. It's possible that the family is going to break up, right? And and now if they break up, what kind of alimony is she going to get? I mean, nowhere's near the alimony. I mean, at least if she wanted to divorce this guy because he abused her, she would have been in much better shape if she could divorce an employed NFL star, she would have a lot more money in a divorce settlement. She got a big alimony check if this guy actually had a job. What kind of alimony check is she going to get now when he's unemployed? See, they can. everybody can pretend, oh, yes, we really care about women. What about these two women? And again, it's not just the wife. It's the young little daughter uh, who, who are important, right? But no, we have to show how much uh, we are against domestic violence. We're all against domestic violence. Nobody thinks it's right to hit women. Nobody. And you can still defend the situation. Say, you know what? Yes, he was a jerk. He shouldn't have hit her. It was bad. I can still tell my son, hey, you don't hit women, right? You don't hit women under any circumstances. And that doesn't be compromised because this guy did it. It doesn't mean I have to say, you know what? Because he did it, he can't play football anymore. It's like, you know, if you make a mistake, then there's zero Tolerance. It's amazing how we have so many three strikes, you're out, or no child, all these things where, hey, we'll forgive, we'll forgive, we'll forgive. But if you do anything 
that is somehow against a special interest or some political crowd, then it's zero tolerance. It's one mistake and you're, you're done. And again, the hypocrisy behind how many people in professional sports, how many athletes are on those fe- on that court, right? I mean, they're on that field. They're on basketball courts or baseball fields that have slapped their wives. I'm sure that Ray Rice is not the only one. He's the only one that got caught on film. Now, I'm not saying that it's it's right because, you know, no, it's wrong in all circumstances. But to say, OK, you can't be in the NBA, NFL anymore. But all these other guys who have hit not only their wives, their girlfriends or people they didn't even marry or people in the past. And the fact that so many people would say, well, I'm going to boycott your game. I'm going to boycott sponsors if they don't if they, if you sponsor, if you have a commercial on the um, the Ravens game, I'm not going to buy your products because you're allowing this wife beater, this spousal abuser. How do we know? How do we know that this isn't the only time he slapped her? How do we know that? You know, I mean, there are guys that are doing a lot worse things to their women, right? Than, than, than supposedly that one thing, even if he did punch her while under the influence of being drunk, right? While he was drunk and while she was drunk and while they were spitting at each other and arguing with one another, Right. Who knows what they're saying? Who knows what she said to get under this guy's skin? Right. She might know sometimes women really know how to push a guy's buttons and the guy, you know, needs to be restrained. But now that he she was coming right at him, it wasn't like he charged her. She was coming right at him and he reacted. And I'm sure that the minute he threw uh, that left, whether it was a slap or a punch, he regretted doing it. He threw it in a in a, in a moment of anger without thinking it through. Right. But again, We don't know if he punched her. We don't know if he slapped her. We don't even know if he hit her in the face. You can't tell. The only thing you can tell is that the metal railing knocked her out, right? And we need a little bit of perspective here. But again, it's all about this outrage. It's like you have to jump on the bandwagon. You have to condemn this guy. You have to, you know, want to kick him out of sports. Because if you don't, you're, you're a wife beater yourself. You think it's perfectly fine to hit women, which you don't, right? There are there are in betweens. It's not all or nothing. It never is. The Peter Ship Show. We were talking quite a bit about inversions. I guess during the last couple of weeks, where the Peter Ship Show was still a daily show, because inversions became all the rage. Uh, the wrath of all the liberal politicians. The most recent one, of course, to make the headlines is Burger King, right? Burger King uh, merging with a uh, Canadian company and moving the headquarters to Canada. And I pointed out, of course, the irony or hypocrisy involved because Burger King is owned by Brazilians. Uh, The majority of the shares were owned by Brazilians. And before the Brazilians bought it, the British owned Burger King. Burger King really was an American uh, for over 20 years. And of course, the combined company is going to have well over half of its sales and profits outside of America. And it will be owned predominantly by Canadians and Brazilians. So why should a Canadian and Brazilian owned company that does most of its revenue outside the United States Why should they want to be a U.S. corporation and subject themselves to the highest corporate tax rates in the world for no reason? Yet somehow they were still trying to make a patriotic argument or an anti-patriotic argument. Why do the Canadians or the, um, uh, the, the Brazilians owe some kind of patriotic loyalty to pay taxes in the United States? And of course, Burger King... Uh, the Canadians and the Brazilian owners of Burger King would still pay taxes to the United States on the profits that they generate in the United States. They just won't have to pay taxes to the United States on the profits they generate outside the United States, which is exactly the way it works with just about every country, every other country in the world, except for America. But this story that I read by David K. Johnson, who's a big reporter. In fact, he's written some uh, negative articles about my dad over the years, normally for the Wall Street Journal. But here he's writing for Newsweek. And his article is entitled Corporate Deadbeats, How Companies Get Rich Off of Taxes. And I'm thinking, how do you get rich off taxes? I mean, H&R Block can get rich off of taxes, right? Because they 
They sell their tax advice, right? And if you're if you're selling a tax shelter, you know, you can get rich off of taxes. If you're a tax lawyer, right, you can get rich off of taxes. I'm thinking, how is it how do you get rich by paying taxes? That doesn't make any sense to me because paying taxes makes you less rich, right? It's an expense. So I'm thinking, how is it possible that David Johnson is going to say that corporations are turning taxes into a revenue source? I'm thinking, how is that even possible, right? Like, you know, and so I read the article and I try to figure out what exactly does this guy talking about where he says that companies are getting rich off of taxes. And basically it boils down to the fact that he's claiming that corporations are getting interest-free loans from the government. And it's the interest-free loan that is the gift. That, you know, whenever you borrow money, you normally have to pay interest. But the IRS is letting corporations borrow money and charging no interest. And that is the gift. It's the lack of interest. It's getting money without having to pay interest that is enabling them to get rich. I'm like, wait a minute, how is that counting? Because the IRS is loaning you your own money. You see, normally when you get an interest-free loan, if you, were, if you could get an interest-free loan, somebody would be loaning you their money, right? They would be giving you money you didn't have. And so if the IRS was really loaning money to companies, meaning the company didn't have any money, and the government said, hey, here's a million dollars, you can have it, pay me back whenever, and I'm not going to charge you any interest, that would be a gift. But what he's saying is the IRS says to a company, hey, you owe a million dollars in taxes. You don't have to pay me that money today. You can pay me that money in the future. Oh, and by the way, I'm not going to charge you interest. That's not a gift, right? Letting you keep your own money is not a gift. And you can't get rich off of that. Now, how is this concept, too, of an interest-free loan coming even into existence? Well, he makes the point that if you are an American company and you earn profits abroad, that you don't have to pay the U.S. taxes on those profits until you repatriate them. So if, if I'm an American company and I make some money in Canada and I leave it in Canada, I'm not paying U.S. taxes on it until I bring it back. So if I bring it back in 10 years and then I pay the taxes 10 years later, as far as uh, 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 David K. Johnson is concerned, I got a gift in the form of 10 years worth of free interest because I, I got to wait 10 years to pay my taxes. But that's not really a gift because if I didn't have to pay my taxes at all, I would be better off because taxes are still checks that you're writing to the government. It's not a check the government is writing me. But of course, if you're a company that's not an American company, right? If you're a Canadian company and you earn your profits abroad, right? You're never taxed. You can bring those profits home whenever you want tax-free. So the fact that we have to pay the taxes in the future, as opposed to other foreign companies that never have to pay those taxes, then it's not a gift. I'd rather not have to pay my taxes ever than have to pay them in the future. And somehow David K. Johnson says, well, because our companies have to pay taxes in the future, whereas companies incorporated in other countries never have to pay taxes at all, well, that our corporations are deadbeats and they're getting rich off the tax code. No, they're not. They're still facing a, an impediment. They're still having to pay the taxes instead of not having to pay them at all. They're just paying them later. And of course, there is a negative aspect to that delay in that if they want to pass on those profits to their shareholders, the shareholders have to wait for the money. You see, if a U.S. company is earning money abroad, right, it can't distribute. It can't take that money it earned and distribute it to its shareholders until it repatriates it and pays the taxes. So the owners don't have the use of the money either. I mean, the corporation still has it to make investments outside the United States, but it can't be brought back to fund investments in the United States or to pay dividends to its American shareholders. So they're doing without the money too. But if it was a foreign company operating under the same circumstances, their company could bring the money back tax-free the day they earn it, the year they earn it. And then they can pay salaries with it or they can pay dividends with it or make investments in the United States. So American companies are not getting rich off this tax code. They are just trying to figure out how to survive this tax code, how to maintain a, their competitive position when basically they're dealing with a stacked deck. They've got 
uh, a liability that companies organized in other countries don't have. And one way to kind of level the playing field is at least to leave their, their international profits abroad as opposed to bringing them home. Because then if they leave them on broad, to the extent that they're there, they're on the same playing field as everybody else. And, and to expect them to, to bring the, the profits home just so they can pay their taxes now, as opposed to pay them later, when other companies don't have to pay them at all, right? They're still paying taxes. Remember, if an American company earns income abroad, it's paying taxes abroad on those earnings. If an American company earns money in Hong Kong, it's paying taxes in Hong Kong. It's not shirking that. It just doesn't want to pay a second level of taxes in the United States. But if a Canadian company earns money in Hong Kong, it pays the taxes in Hong Kong and then brings the money home tax-free. So how are our corporations deadbeats? They're still being penalized for being American. But the whole idea is to, is to create the, the false impression that they're getting, they're getting rich off the tax code as if the government is giving U.S. corporations money. They're not giving U.S. corporations anything. They're taking from U.S. corporations. The fact that they're taking in the future something that other countries never take at all does not amount to a gift. And so the inference there, of course, is, well, the rest of us have to pay higher taxes because American corporations are shirking their responsibilities. The rest of us have to pay higher taxes. And that's just not true. They're not shirking anything. They're just trying to survive the U.S. government that imposes higher tax rates than anybody else. And if U.S. corporations paid more taxes, it doesn't mean that anybody else would pay less. I don't think that would happen at all. I think everybody else would still pay the same, maybe even more. Because what do tax revenues have to do with expenditures anyway? It's not like we have a balanced budget. I mean, you could make that argument if the budget was balanced. But we have a huge deficit. So, I mean... It, it, there, there is no relationship right now between revenues and expenditures. So to say, if the government got a little bit more revenue from corporations, the rest of us could pay lower taxes. No, they'd still have a deficit. The deficit would still be there, even if corporations paid more in taxes. In fact, who knows? If corporations paid more in taxes right now, maybe they would have less to invest and less to expand their businesses, and maybe they would be less profitable. Maybe they would employ even fewer Americans. Maybe some Americans owe their, their jobs to the fact that a lot of that money is left untaxed outside the United States. Now, of course, more Americans could have jobs if we can bring that money back tax-free, but the fact that corporations are not allowed to do that, well, that could be undermining uh, domestic tax collection. Maybe Americans are paying higher taxes because we're foolish enough to tax corporations on their foreign earnings because we're punishing corporations for bringing their revenues back to the United States. Maybe that is the reason uh, that um, the economy is weaker and maybe people are paying higher taxes than would otherwise be the case. But all of this, you know, corporate vilifying, I mean, look at the picture. On the cover, you've got this corporate deadbeat. This guy has supposedly got a, a rope around his body, but he's smoking a cigar. He probably lit the cigar with a hundred dollar bill, right? That he that he that he stole from his employees. And the whole idea is that, you know, the code is making them rich. Look, the taxes aren't making them rich. It's their hard work, right? It's the products that they're producing, right? It's it's the innovation. That's what's making them rich. It's taxes that undermine those efforts. They're trying to get rich despite the tax code, right? They're not rich because of the tax code. There's nothing the U.S. government is doing to further the interest of these companies, right? Everything that they're doing is undermining that. And corporations have to spend a lot of money that might otherwise be used more productively to figure out how to avoid uh, these oppressive taxes, and regulations that are undermining the profitability. It's not the other way around. But again, they want to create the impression that all this money is being doled out to corporations. They're just, they're, they just got their, 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 their pockets open or their hands out, and the government is dumping all this money in there through the tax code. That that's what inversions are about, because they want a reaction. They want the government to, to clamp down, to raise taxes, to make these inversions uh, less uh, likely to occur raise taxes, vilify the rich, vilify the corporations, pretend that they're not getting rich because of their hard work or their innovation, but it's just free money they're getting from the government. 
right? That's the only reason they have money because it makes it easier for you to want to punish somebody, want to attack somebody with high taxes if you don't feel that they earned their money. If you just think they were given their money for nothing, although apparently if you're on welfare or you know disability or food stamps, you know no one has a problem with those people getting money for nothing, right? But I guess if you're rich and you're getting money from the government, that's bad. If you're poor or middle class and you're getting money from the government, well, that's democracy, right? But they're trying to just vilify these guys so they have an excuse to punish them so they can justify uh, their envy and their class warfare because if they say, well, they're not rich because they deserved it, because they earned it, but because it was given to them by the government. In fact, it was my money, right? They're almost It's like the government took money from the poor and the middle class and gave it to these rich corporations, and that's why they have all this money. And we need to stop robbing the poor and the middle class and giving to the rich, right? This is the impression that Newsweek, that David K. Johnson, that the left is hoping to create by the way they're falsely reporting about inversions and the, the true, the true cause of the problem, which is not the corporations or the inversions, but the U.S. government and its abusive uh, tax code, the, uh, the highest, uh, most, you know, corporate tax code in the world and how the fact that corporations can get out from under it any way they can uh, actually benefits uh, the country. And of course, what would benefit the country the most if there was no co- tax to be avoided in the first place. In fact, what we really should do is abolish the corporate income tax completely, right? That's what we need to do for maximum economic growth and let the employees pay the taxes on their incomes, the shareholders pay the taxes on their dividends and capital gains, uh, and, 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 or the, and let the customers, I guess they, you know, they, they end up paying it through uh, the price of the products, but don't tax it at the corporate level because all it does is undermine investment and economic growth. Of course, I like to get rid of the income tax on the personal level too, right? But in order to do that, see, getting rid of the corporate income tax, we can do that and keep the welfare state. We would just have a more profitable economy to loot, right? So getting rid of the corporate income tax, you can still have the welfare state, the big government. In fact, maybe even a bigger government because we'd have a more vibrant economy. But it's, it's, it's good politics to go after the corporations. You get a lot of votes, even though it's bad economics. But of course, if you want to get rid of the personal income tax too, then you got to cut a lot of government spending. Then you got to really shrink the size of government, which I want to do, which would be great, But if you're not going to do that, if you're going to have all this government, it's a lot easier to pay for it by abolishing the corporate income tax and then taxing the shareholders directly rather than indirectly by taxing the corporations uh, and all the other stakeholders, because it's a much more efficient way for the government to raise revenue. The Peter Schiff Show. I was stunning. Should have never let you get free reign over my petty piece of change in the lane of a main day. The looks that Most of the action this week in the financial markets was in the currency markets, commodity markets, gold market. Stocks were on the defensive in the U.S., uh, but it wasn't a big down week. Uh, in fact, I think the Nasdaq was about unchanged, but the Dow and the S&P were lower, uh, not dramatically slow, but the Dow did close below 17,000, 16,987. And looks like I would guess by looking at the charts that we have some more short-term weakness coming. Another correction. Again, I'm not looking for a crash because I do believe that the Fed won't let that happen, at least at least not yet. So there will be enough money printing. But again, the real action in the foreign exchange market, uh, the Swiss franc, closed at its lowest level, I think, since November of last year. Australian dollar is down to its lows, I think, since earlier in the year. Was it maybe February or March? Gold all the way down to the lowest it's been since January. So almost all of the year's gains in the gold market have now been erased. And oil prices this week, although they bounced off the lows, but touching the lowest level that they've been, since April, May of, uh, of, of last year, of 2013, uh, oil getting down just above $90 a barrel. Remember, we were about 108 was the high uh, back in late June. And so now we settled the week uh, just, uh, just over $92 a barrel. But all of this dollar strength was the result 
of everybody focusing on all the money that they're promising to print in Europe, in Switzerland, in Japan. And why are they promising to print all that money? Because they think it's going to grow their economies. It's not going to. It's going to interfere with economic growth. But one thing they will ignite is more inflation. So these low inflation numbers that we saw are all about to reverse because all of these uh, you know, countries now seeing drops in their exchange rates, they're going to see increases in prices more directly as a result. In fact, look at how bad inflation already is now in Japan, and it's about to get a lot worse with this renewed weakness in the Japanese yen. You know, even though oil prices maybe are coming down for Americans, they're not really coming down for the Japanese or the Europeans. Uh, they're going up. They're going up for other people as they are piling into the dollar. But of course, in order to uh, you know perpetuate this false narrative, you have to ignore all of the evidence that is mounting that undermines U.S. economic growth story. Like this week, we got news from McDonald's that their sales dropped by the most in 11 years, the biggest sales slump since 2003. Now, McDonald's is, you know, a major retailer. Why are their sales going down? I mean, you know, people are having a hard time even affording McDonald's. Look at the surge in in uh, consumer credit led by a big increase in auto loans and lo- and student borrowing. Again, why are people buying so much, borrowing so much money to buy cars? And I mentioned that, you know, car sales were the big driver of this week's um, uh, retail sales because the terms of financing are so loose. It's so easy to qualify for a loan. People are taking advantage of the fact that they're able to buy a nice new car, even though they really can't afford it, thanks to uh, easy credit terms. And also, why are so many people going to college? They probably have no choice. They can't get a job. And the government will give them all this money if they just go to college. So you have people paying more money to go to college because there's no jobs. And they think that a college degree is going to help get them a job. No, it's not. It's just going to give them a big debt. So when they get out of college, they'll still be unemployed, except now they'll be unemployed with a bunch of debt. Maybe they'll learn something. Maybe they won't. Who knows? In fact, whatever you learn, you generally forget. You know, a lot of times the way people study in courses, you don't even do anything until the day before your exam and then you cram and, you know, you, 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 you learn it, you memorize it long enough to pass your exam. And then by, you know, the end of the semester, the next year, you don't even remember. So chances are when you graduate, I mean, the odds that when you're after you graduate from your fourth year that you even remember what you earned as a freshman, when most freshmen probably don't even remember what they earned as a freshman when they're sophomores. Right. But you have all these people going into school. They they ignored. Look at this on statistics on foreclosures. We got news this week. Fifty five thousand properties now in foreclosure in August. That's a 12 percent increase from the prior month. This is the second month in a row where foreclosures are going up. So we got auto delinquencies going up. We've got home foreclosures going up. And I thought this is supposedly the recovery. The economy is getting so much better that the Fed could tighten. Everybody else is a disaster, and we're able to tighten. Well, if if things are so good, why are delinquencies and foreclosures on the rise? And if delinquencies and foreclosures are on the rise now, and the Fed hasn't even started tightening yet, imagine what would happen to foreclosures and, and delinquencies in a world where the Fed is actually raising rates. That's the world that everybody is looking forward to when they're buying the dollar. That's the world that everybody is looking forward to when they are selling their gold. But that's not the world that they're going to live in. The world that they're going to be buying back their gold at and selling their dollars. Of course, the prices will be much different, right? With respect to gold, the price will be higher. And for dollars, the exchange rate lower, when they figure out what's going to happen, that we're in as bad shape, if not worse, than Europe and Japan. See, everybody's thinking, aha, you see, we've solved our problems so we can raise rates, but Europe and Japan haven't solved their problems yet, so they have to ease even more. Well, when are they going to figure out that we haven't solved our problems any more than they have? We just think we do. We just think that because rates have been so low for so long that it must have worked, but it hasn't worked. Right. It's like, say, oh, we've been we've been drink. We've been drinking so much alcohol. We're never going to get hung over. Yeah, we will. And in fact, it's just starting to show up. But people are ignoring the symptoms 
because they are wedded to this narrative and they don't want to change. Just like I mentioned in the case of, you know, with Trayvon Martin or whatever back then, no matter how many facts come up to disturb what you want to believe happened, you remain oblivious to them. So you people want to believe this fantasy about this recovery. They want to believe that what the Fed did worked. They want to believe that the Fed can unwind the balance sheet, raise interest rates. They want to believe, just like, you know, like a little kid wants to believe in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy. There are a lot of things that you want to believe in, but eventually you can't believe in it anymore because, you know, you just, it, you, too many facts come out and you can't believe it anymore. And part of it because you get older, you get wiser, and the fairy tales no longer make sense because you start to question them. Well, here it's like you have a bunch of people that never grow up. They never want to question this fairy tale, no matter how little sense it makes, no matter how many facts would come up to show that it's impossible, that this recovery is impossible, and even more impossible would be for the Fed to take away all the props, right? That the Fed could yank the table underneath from under the cloth and the dishes, and the dishes and the cloth are going to stay suspended in midair, right? To believe that that can happen. Yet that's what everybody believes because they are buying the dollars because they think that's going to happen. They're selling their goal because they think that is going to happen. Look, what is going to happen as a result of the renewed uh, uh, money printing, the renewed extra QE, uh, lower rates in Europe. It's not going to revive their economies. It's not going to revive the economy in Japan, but it will spark more inflation. That they will get. And then they can't say, oh, we need even cheaper money because we, don't e we need even more inflation than the extra inflation we got. At some point, they're not going to be able to talk about why they need more inflation. But... They might be talking about why they have to combat it, which means they'll have to be raising their interest rates, which is something that we are not going to do. And what's going to happen here? We're talking about raising interest rates. Everybody is expecting an increase in interest rates. But what is going to happen? We got 1% GDP growth in the first half of the year. Why everybody expects the second half is going to be three to four makes no sense. Yes, they're focusing on the 4% growth. We'll see where it's revised. But the 4% for Q2 without realizing that that's all a function of the negative 3.1 from Q1. It's all the holdover GDP that was pushed into Q2. They want to ignore that. They, they, they didn't want to ignore the weather, right? Uh, or they wanted to blame the, the bad number in the, in, the, in the winter on the weather. But they want to ignore the weather when it comes to its effect on, a, on an, an artificially boosted number in the second quarter. And so they're holding on to this fantasy that we're going to get third and fourth quarter GDP that's going to be as good as the second quarter. No, we don't have any pent up demand from the cold weather that's going to boost Q3 or Q4. In fact, if anything, this big inventory build from Q2 is going to come back to bite us in Q3 or Q4. In fact, who knows how bad this Christmas can end up being. It could be the worst holiday season in years. Uh, because all the real evidence uh, of, for consumers shows that they are strained. They don't have jobs. They don't have purchasing power. They are dealing with a rising cost of living, even despite the strong dollar, the recent rise in the dollar. Again, this is throwing American consumers a temporary lifeline. But it's only temporary because the dollar's rise will not last. It's temporary until people start to realize, right, the box that we're in. And when the Fed comes out and has to actually say that, you know what, the economy is weaker than we thought. Therefore, we're going to have to do more QE than we thought. And the rate hikes that we've been talking about are no longer on the table at all. It's not a question of when in 2015 do we raise rates. We're not even talking about raising rates because we're doing a whole new round of QE because we don't have the economic growth that we thought we'd have. And of course, these temporary strength in the dollar is going to undermine in the short run commodity prices, which is going to give more fuel for the Fed's argument that there's not enough inflation. They can actually say, well, the rise in the dollar and the drop in commodity prices, that means deflation is here. That raises the, the, the risk. That raises the warning flag of deflation. So no, we can't raise interest rates. Not with a dollar up and commodities down and deflation looming. 
you know, another excuse to come back with more money printing, which is exactly what they're going to have, especially if another excuse is a weak stock market. Because if the stock market really believes the Fed is going to tighten, then the stock market has to go down. And the real estate market has to continue to go down. In fact, another uh, statistic that came out during the week was the percentage of Americans who thought it was a good time to buy a house is now at a new record low. And and so that's another uh, piece of anecdotal evidence that the housing market is suffering. Not only is it the foreclosures and the sales being off, I mentioned it was the biggest plunge in purchase applications in 14 years. So you have all this information, and I mentioned this earlier uh, in the Peter Schiff show, that I thought, based on the evidence I got months ago, that the housing recovery was over, that that echo bubble was deflating, and the Fed was basing the recovery on the rise in home prices, the continued rise in home prices, the continuation of a rise in the stock market. The stock market is barely up this year. And it wouldn't take much of a decline to bring it negative. And again, there are plenty of stocks in the S&P, in the the Russell 2000, that are down 20, 30% or more this year. So the people who own those stocks are certainly less wealthy. And real estate prices now going down, foreclosures going up. If they start to come down more, which they will if the Fed raise rates or if people believe that rate hikes are imminent, that's going to be another reason for the Fed not to raise them. It's going to be another reason for the Fed to come back with more QE. The real estate market's going down. The stock market's going down. The wealth effect is working in reverse. And they and they and they spent so much time and effort right in order to create the illusion of wealth. Are they going to sit back and watch the illusion evaporate, vanish before their eyes? Of course not. And the temporary strength of the dollar and the weakness in gold provides the cover because now they can say, well, there's no reason why we can't print money because the dollar's not weakening. You know, the gold price isn't rising. So the markets, by buying the dollar on the basis of thinking the Fed's going to tighten, are basically helping to create the conditions where the Fed doesn't have to tighten. Right. It's it's the it's these decisions to buy the dollar that now Give, their, uh, give the Fed a reason not to tighten when the only reason people were buying the dollar is because they thought the Fed was going to tighten. But by buying the dollar and suppressing commodity prices, they make it possible for the Fed not to tighten, right? Damned if you do, damned if you don't. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that works in reverse where the action of the market participants who are acting in anticipation of an event, their own actions make sure that the event that they're anticipating doesn't in fact happen. That's it for today's podcast. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you are sharing it with your friends. Don't forget to like us on Facebook, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter, and help me spread the word about the Peter Schiff Show in podcast format so we get more people listening on a weekly basis to two hours of economic sanity in what is really an insane world.